We're, we're, we're actually going to cover a lot of territory, uh, just looking at the, the research behind integrative treatment. A lot of the perception is that there is none. That there is no evidence for it, but we're going to spend the next few hours going over the evidence. Uh, I guess the first question is why do we even look at this? Why are we even interested in it? You know, what, aren't our cancer treatments good enough? They're saying, no, if we have made such great advances, we really w wouldn't even have to be concerned with looking at integrative treatments. But if, uh, if we look at what, what is the actual state of things in the world right now, uh, this is just some, uh, some statistics. Uh, just looking at the changes in the incidence of cancer. You see even in 1900, we had 3% of deaths from cancer. 100 years later, it was up to 24%. Um, when you look at it, you know, childhood cancers too, we're seeing the same increases, which is suggesting that it's not because people are living longer that we have more cancers, we're even getting them in every age group. Uh, this is just an example of breast cancer. So again, back in the 1940, um, the incidence of breast cancer was 50 in 100,000. 100 years, or 60 years later, it was up to three, almost three times that amount. Um, and then another study looking at the uh, statistics from 1975 to 1994, uh, cancer in women was increasing by 1.6% every year, in men by 1.5%, and that trend hasn't stopped yet. It's still continuing pretty much in the same increase. Um, this is a, an, an, another interesting one, where they're looking at breast cancer um, in Chinese women living in China. So women living in China, th their incidence of breast cancer is, you know, 40 to 60 per 100,000. And again, a lot of times it was attributed, well, maybe it's a different genetic pattern, that's why they have less uh, breast cancer, except when they moved to the States and they looked at the Chinese women in San Francisco and we see that it came up pretty much to the same levels as the Americans. So we're seeing that the environment is, is having a big impact. Um, this was another paper uh, that was uh, published in the New England Journal. This was, this was done by an epidemiologist. So this is a guy that was just looking at numbers. Uh, he, you know, he, wa he wasn't interested also in uh, looking at, you know, response to chemotherapy, you know, uh, whether you're getting partial responses or even complete response. He was just looking at, are they alive or dead? It was, it was very, you know, basic in this. And uh, what he was showing that there was an increase in the mortality of cancer rates. Um, again, just showing this kind of steady increase. Um, and then he did another follow-up paper you know, 10 years later, we did another one showing that the increases were continuing, even more so. Uh, they found a couple of places where there was some decreases in cancer. And there, the ones that where they found the decreases were mainly in cancer of the cervix and the colon. And this they attributed, you know, to screening, but in those two cancers, those are about the only two cancers that we actually have screening for precancerous lesions. So you can actually catch them before they become cancer. And if you do it then, then you can actually reduce the, the incidence of the cancer. It hasn't worked so well in screening to try for early detection. So the screening for early detection where you're trying to catch it small hasn't really changed the mortality very much. You really had to catch it before it converted into cancer. And the other one where there was some decrease in the cancer was in lung cancer, mainly because of the decrease in smoking. And this was another paper that was very controversial when it came out. This was done by a group of oncologists um, in Australia. And they did a large review of uh, clinical trials looking, again, just at the, you know, the, you know, the bottom line. Um, the, the title says, The Contribution of Cytotoxic Chemotherapy to Five-Year Survival in Adult Malignancies. So again, they were looking at adult cancers and looking at the change 
that uh, in the five-year survival based on chemotherapy, since chemotherapy was introduced. And their conclusion was um, that the, the, the quote there, the overall contribution of curative and adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy to five-year survival was estimated to be 2.3% in Australia and 2.1% in the United States. So they made, again, uh, very little impact on the five-year survival since the introduction of chemotherapy. And even with that reduction, most of that came in a, a few specific cancers, like uh, testicular, Hodgkin's disease, or a few that contributed most of that number. For most of the cancers, there hasn't really been much change in the five-year survival. Um, the place where there's been some changes in shorter term. So they're getting people from one year survival to one and a half year. But in terms of uh, the, you know, the, the significant you know, five year survival, it's, it's not changing much. Okay, this is an, another just recent paper that came out now that's, uh, you know, that, that maybe is complicating the picture, but also maybe explaining some of these uh, numbers. Um, this one was uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy induces breast cancer metastasis to a particular mechanism. Um, so what this is, at neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy, this is when they give chemotherapy to women with breast cancer before they do surgery. They say, we'll give you chemo first, we'll shrink it, and then we'll do the surgery. So this chemotherapy that they're doing, this one, they, they looked at the standard stuff, which was doxyrubicine, cyclophosphamide, um, and then followed by paclitaxel. This is a, a standard protocol. And what they found was that uh, the, the chemotherapy was increasing this particular score, which is a, a score that measures the tendency for the cancers to metastasize. They said, so after they gave the chemotherapy, there was an increase in the score suggesting that the chemo may have increased the chance of the cancer spreading before they did the surgery the opposite of what was intended. So this, again, where things become even more confusing in terms of what exactly is the chemotherapy doing? Because it actually did shrink the tumors. The tumors got smaller when they gave the chemo, but they increased the chance of it spreading. Um, there's been some other work now going on related to this, which they, that's involved in what they call the cancer stem cell theory. I'm gonna go a little bit further into that. Um, but the, they're finding that almost all cancers that they look at, there are stem cells that are, make up maybe two or three percent of the tumors. The stem cells are the ones that are usually not killed by chemo or radiation. And those are the ones that are more aggressive and the ones that tend to spread in the body and cause metastases. So the stem cells are the, the sort of the, the critical part. And they did some other work too where they found that, uh, again, giving this neoadjuvant chemotherapy, was actually shrinking the tumor but increasing the population of this cancer stem cells, which again is increasing the dangerous cells within the tumor, even though it's looking like it's responding. Okay, and these are just some other uh, statistics looking at the effects on, on vitamins and, and, breast, and cancer incidents of different kinds. So this one was looking at uh, B vitamins and lung cancer risk. Um, and here they were showing that uh, if you had high levels of B6, folic acid, or methionine, there was associated with a 50% or greater reduction in lung cancer. And if all three were good, then it was even a better reduction. Um, and then you'll get these kind of studies um, that, again, just make a lot of headlines but really confuse a lot of things. So this is a study. Um, where they were, it was a, it was a, large, uh, a large epidemiological study where they were, they were looking at uh, the effects of vitamins in different health measures. And their conclusion in this study was multivitamins increase the deaths in older women. And when this came out, they said this, you know, word went out all over the world, this made headlines everywhere. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, everyone stopped their multivitamins. They said, well, you take a multivitamin, you're gonna die, according to the headlines. When you actually looked inside the study at different parts of it, they said, well, the women taking B-complex vitamins, they had a 7% decrease in mortality. If they were taking vitamin C, there was a 4% decrease. 
If they took vitamin D, there was an 8% decrease in mortality. So they're looking at all these different pieces, saying that it was decreasing the, your de the death rate. But somehow, they were able to pull out this number saying that a multivitamin was increasing it. So how did this happen? Now, fortunately, just after this study, there was another study done in Europe. And it was a similar kind of thing. They were looking at the, the effects of uh, vitamin mineral supplementation on different diseases. And in this one, um, they shed, said that uh, baseline users of antioxidant supplements had a significantly reduced risk of cancer mortality, about, you know, almost cut it in half. But they actually broke down the statistics more. Um, so here they also said the all-cause mortality, not just cancer, but of all diseases, was reduced by 42% compared to people not using any, any supplements. But there was this other group within it. They said they, they had what they had called the non-users at baseline. So people who came into the study not taking anything, but somewhere along the way they started taking a multivitamin. And they said in that group there was an increase in mortality. So why did that happen? They said what they found was that they had what they called the sick user effect, which means that these people started taking the vitamins because they were diagnosed with some serious illness. So it wasn't that the vitamins were causing the illness, the illness was causing them to use the vitamins. But when you're just doing associations, they don't differentiate between that. They're not looking at cause and effect. So here though, they said if you separate out those, then everyone else was decreasing the mortality. Again, it's only the ones who were already sick where there was an increase. The previous study, they didn't separate that out. But it was assumed that that's probably what happened there too. And this is the latest, the latest controversial one that just got, it was just released now that's called long-term one carbon metabolism related vitamin D use in relation to lung cancer risk in the vitamins and lifestyle cohort study. Um, so here they were looking at the use of supplements um, and lung cancer risk. And they were using all different kinds, multivitamins, different kinds of supplements, and they came out with this statistic. Again, this is the one that's making headlines right now. It said there was an increased risk of lung cancer in people using individual supplements of B12 and B6. If they were using a B complex or multivitamin, using a whole sec, they didn't see any increase in lung cancer, only when they were using the isolated vitamins. But there's a lot of information they didn't give here. In this one, again, they, they didn't try to separate out the sick user effect, like why were they taking these isolated vitamins? They didn't, uh, and the other thing they didn't do was blood levels. And that's especially important for things like B12. Because um, most people are gonna take a B12 supplement because they're deficient in it. And most people are deficient in B12 because they're not absorbing it. So that by taking a supplement, you're probably still not gonna correct the deficiency. But again, no blood levels were done here, so we don't know what the actual effect was. And again, it could have been that the ones taking the B12 supplement, after supplementing, they were still B12 deficient. And it was the deficiency that was causing the increase, not the supplement. But I said we had no information because none of that information was separated out. What gets sent out though, is that you know if you take you know, B12, B12 and B6, you're gonna die of lung cancer. Um, this one was actually a, a randomized controlled trial. Uh, multivitamins and the prevention of cancer in men, the physician's health study, uh, randomized controlled trial. So this is considered a more significant one because it was a prospective, double-blind controlled trial. Um, and they were using actually uh, male physicians who presumably were already living a better, life, a healthier lifestyle and they added what was essentially a low-dose one-a-day multivitamin. And even in that group, um, they showed that there was an 8% decrease in, in total cancer incidence. So in a healthy population, using a low-dose multivitamin, 
still gave some decrease in cancer incidence. So, the, I mean, if, if, if this was a drug trial, I mean, this would have been big news and everybody would be going on the med new medication because it's a, a vitamin trial was kind of dismissed. Um, this is, again, just some more uh, studies looking at uh, the effects of vitamins in cancer. So this was a you know, smaller study, 65 patients with bladder cancer, either getting just, again, a low-dose RDA multivitamin or getting the multivitamin plus significant doses of vitamin A, B6, vitamin C, vitamin E, and zinc. And they looked at 10 months later, they all got the standard treatment, and you know, in one group, again, multivitamin, the other one, multivitamin plus. And after 10 months, they said 80% of the group with the regular multivitamin were relapsing. Only half of that amount were relapsing if they took the additional sort of higher dose vitamins. And again, this is significant because, you know, in that large trial with the, uh, the, the physician study, if they had done another arm, with, with higher dose vitamins, the likelihood is they would have seen a much bigger decrease. Okay, and this one is again another study looking at antioxidants and breast cancer risk. Um, and here they compared antioxidant intake of 10 years or more um, in cases with breast cancer compared to controls. And the results were that uh, the breast cancer risk in premenopausal women was reduced by more than half in women taking zinc. So zinc seemed to be very protective against breast cancer. Um, in postmenopausal women, there was a 26% decrease with a multivitamin, 42% with a beta carotene, 21% with vitamin C, 25% with E. And again, the, the winner seemed to be zinc in terms of having the greatest impact on reducing breast cancer. And this is uh, another uh, review paper looking at vitamin D. Um, and this was based mostly on observational studies. They had one randomized control trial. Um, and their conclusion was that the, the expected effect of raising your vitamin D levels to the 40 to 60 range um, reduce case uh, mortality with breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer in half. Um, you know, when they, when they looked at uh, vitamin D levels in this country, um, they saw that pretty much everybody was deficient. Uh, most people were, you know, running well below 30, which is the cutoff point. So most people are not anywhere close to these blood levels. Uh, in order to get to those blood levels, you need to usually take about between four and 5,000 units a day, not 400. Um, so if you want to get to protective levels of vitamin D, um, you, you need to be taking enough. I mean, the, the natural way, of course, of getting vitamin D is sun exposure. But uh, again, the, the, there's a lot of sun avoidance now. Uh, so that, again, when they looked at, again, just they screened the population, Obviously, nobody was getting enough because almost everybody was low. There was only one group who had really good vitamin D levels. There's the lifeguards. So the, so the lifeguards were running in the 60s. But these are people who are standing outside in the sun all day without clothes on, and they had great vitamin D levels. This was kind of an interesting paper, because this was looking at... Uh, what they call spontaneous regression. So these are people with cancer um, who reported that the cancer disappeared. They had, without conventional treatment, the cancer went away. Uh, what some people would call it's a, a medical miracle. The cancer just disappeared. So this, this group went out to interview uh, 200 people who reported spontaneous regression. It just disappeared. And what they found was that 87% of them made major dietary changes, 65% were using nutritional substances, 55% were, were detoxifying. So out of these people whose cancer just went away, they were pretty much all making some major changes in their life. So again, these medical miracles take a lot of work. 
Okay, now this is, this is um, we're getting more into to cancers that are already there, looking at the effects of the vitamins. Uh, so this was a pros pr prospective study of women with breast cancer um, who were getting, they all got the standard uh, conventional treatments and a group of them were adding nutritional supplements starting early in the diagnosis. So they started within the first six months after being diagnosed. So they're getting the conventional treatments and they were also taking the vitamins. Um, and they found in this one that the women who were taking vitamin E, vitamin C, or multivitamins had an 18% decreased risk of death and a 22% decreased risk of the cancer coming back. So you could have a significant impact on the treatment of the breast cancer. And in this one, again, it was adding modest levels. There's another uh, kind of similar breast cancer study. Uh, this time they're looking at women who had, were taking multivitamins and minerals even before they started before they were diagnosed and continued them through their treatment. And again, so those women they found were 31% less likely to have a recurrence, 47% less likely to die of their breast cancer, and 27% less likely to die of anything else. Um, in this study, too, they, they did separate things out a bit, and they found that the, if the women were only taking vitamins without the minerals, you didn't get that benefit, which would kind of fit with the other study showing how important zinc was to reducing the, uh, the risk. Um, this is another study on, uh, on uh, gastro, gastric and esophageal cancer. Uh, another randomized control trial where they added a preventive supplement of uh, vitamin C, E, and selenium. Again, it was kind of a modest uh, supplementation program. But doing that, they found that they reduced, again, by half, the deaths from gastric and esophageal cancer. Th this was, um, to me, was a very underreported study. It was a small study. Uh, there were only 18 patients with small cell lung cancer which has a pretty terrible prognosis. Um, the expected survival at 30 months is 1% with conventional treatment. Um, again, even within one year, probably the bulk of them are not surviving. But in this one, they had eight of the 18, 40% of them were still alive six years later. So when they're expected to have no one alive, they still had 40% alive. And that statistic was better if they, you know, in the group that started the vitamins the earliest. This was another lung cancer study. Um, There's a little larger group, but in this one, they, they uh, by the way, that previous one, um, when I went to the paper and I looked at what did they give them, they were giving them pretty serious supplementation. They were giving pretty much all of the vitamins, minerals in good doses. So they were doing some, some pretty serious vitamins there. This one, they did another one where they only gave vitamin C, vitamin E, and beta carotene. So again, it was a much more modest uh, supplementation. And in this one, they, they, they were showing that the, um, the, the survival at, at one year um, you know, went from 33% you know, to 39%. So here we're seeing that if, uh, if you do give a little bit of supplement, you get a little bit of benefit. In the previous one, they gave a lot and they got much more benefit. And this is one of the, this is a lab study, but it's just to help explain why that might be. So this was a, a study done in rats, where they gave them a carcinogen that produces cancer in the rats 100% of the time. A very good carcinogen. Um, and then they did various groups. Um, they were using supplements of selenium, magnesium, vitamin C, and vitamin A. So they used four different ones. They used them by themselves, individually, in combinations of two together, in combinations of three, and all four together. So they gave them this carcinogen, then they gave them the vitamins. If they used one vitamin, they reduced the incidence of the cancer by 50%. If they gave two together, they reduced it by 70%. They gave three together by 80%. If they gave four together, they present, prevented most of the cancers from forming. 
This was another one too, just another lab study just showing this synergism. Uh, so with vitamin C and vitamin K3 both have good anti-cancer effects, but if you put the two together, they got the effect at 10 to 50 times lower dosage. So the, the synergism between vitamins is important. Um, then we get this study. Again, this is one that uh, is another one that everybody knows about, certainly in the cancer world. So it says the effect, the effect of vitamin E and beta carotene on the incidence of lung cancer and other cancers in male smokers. So this one, they're taking a group of smokers and they're giving them either vitamin E or beta carotene and looking at the incidence of lung cancer. And in this group, they said, well, they gave them the vitamin E, it made no difference. But they said in the beta carotene group, they showed an 18% increase in lung cancer. So here they said, you, you give this to the smokers, and we didn't prevent lung cancer, we increased it. So again, the word went out, you know, antioxidants aren't going to increase your cancer risk. <laughs> so what happened here? Now, be before they did this study, they had a lot of information. The reason they did it in the first place, they said they had over 200 epidemiological studies showing fruits and vegetables with high antioxidant levels were lower in cancer risk. They had 11 studies just on beta carotene showing that it was protective against lung cancer. So you have all this information saying that these things should have been reducing it, and instead they showed an increase. So, you know, why would that be so? Oh, by the way, when they did this study, um, there are actually a lot of people who were writing into them saying, do not do this study this way, it's not going to work. So the ones who are already knowledgeable about uh, the nutritional medicine said, if you do this, it will not work. But they did it anyways. Um, and this is the reason why they were saying it, because there was research showing that isolated antioxidants can become free radicals in an environment high in free radicals. What does this mean? If you take a pop, you know, an environment that has a lot of free radicals and you throw in one fairly wimpy antioxidant, what it'll do is what it's supposed to do, it'll neutralize a free radical, but in the process it becomes a free radical, and sometimes a very aggressive one. What normally happens is that, that then gets passed down a chain. So this one goes, passes on to the next, to the next, until it's finally neutralized. They said this, they didn't do that. They just gave an isolated beta carotene. And in essence, what they were doing was not reducing the free radicals. They're actually increasing them by, the, by doing it this way. They're actually making the situation worse. Um, this is another study. Again, this was um, a study on head and neck cancer. And again, this, this is to, to show something similar. Um, here they had head and neck cancers, head and neck cancer patients being treated with radiation, which is the standard treatment. And then there again, they were given either beta carotene or vitamin E or a placebo. Um, and here they said the results were there was a 40% higher early occurrence rate in the supplement group. Uh, by the way, there was no, di after when they did a longer term follow up, there was no difference in the groups, but in the early, the early part, they said it was increasing the early recurrence of the cancer. So of course, again, the word went out, make sure you don't give antioxidants when you're doing radiation because you're going to increase the, the or it's going to decrease the effect. That was the conclusion that came from this. What didn't seem to get very well publicized is the same group in the same journal published a follow-up paper a year later. And here, again, they broke down the numbers a little more. So here they said the interaction between antioxidant, vitamin supplementation, and cigarette smoking during radiation therapy in relation to long-term effects on recurrence and mortality. So what they found here is that group of patients who had an increased early recurrence were only the ones who were smoking during their radiation treatments. So what was going on here was very similar to the other study. You know, radiation is, is creating a lot of free radicals, and the smoking is adding a lot of free radicals to the mix. So this was another high free radical environment. They were throwing in one low-dose antioxidant, and they were making the situation worse. 
if they weren't smoking at the same time, they didn't get that increased recurrence. It didn't happen. It was only if they added the smoking to it. So the recommendation should have been don't smoke during your radiation rather than don't take antioxidants during your radiation. Um, but even that, that little bit of antioxidant, um, it still had some benefit. It still had a, a decrease in the amount of uh, uh, damage to the healthy tissue. And here, this is just some more laboratory evidence kind of supporting these kind of conclusions. Um, so here, um, there, he was, he, this, in this particular one, he was testing a mixture of vitamin A, vitamin E succinate, vitamin C, um, and on the effect of uh, proliferation of melanoma cells in culture. So when those, each of those vitamins are used individually, it didn't have much effect on the growth of the cancer. When they used it together, then it had a significant, it reduced the growth by 50%. Then if they just used the same mixture but increased the amount of vitamin C, they were able to reduce the growth by 90%. So again, we're seeing here that in order to get really good effects, you need to use groups of vitamins, you need to use combinations, and you need to use them in the right amounts. Another similar one from the same, uh, the same researcher, saying vitamin A and beta carotene at high doses administered before radiation and during the entire uh, treatment period uh, produced more than a 90% cure, cure rate in mice with uh, transplanted breast cancer. If they used only the radiation or even only the antioxidants alone, they didn't get much of effect. You really had to have the combination in order to get the results. And then there's a couple of review papers um, looking at the, the effect of antioxidants and uh, uh, used with chemotherapy. Um, maybe we'll just save it till it might get answered. So, um, so this was a review paper. So in this one, uh, Simone actually was a uh, radiation oncologist, so he was, he, he was looking at this, if you want, from the inside. Um, so here he found 280 papers um, looking at the combination of, of antioxidants and chemotherapy. He actually found 50 human clinical trials using different kinds of combinations of antioxidants. And the conclusion was is that in general, they improved the killing effect of the chemotherapy on the cancer, but decreased the side effects on the healthy tissue. So it was protecting normal tissue, but increasing the effect on the cancer tissue. Um, another similar review paper, this one he used more rigid criteria. He, only, he was only looking at 19 clin clinical trials. And uh, same conclusion though, none of the trials reported any evidence of decreasing the effectiveness of the chemo when they added the antioxidants. And this is a big fear in, in the cancer world, is that you give antioxidants, then the it's going to interfere with the effect of the chemotherapy. They were not able to find any clinical trial where that, that showed up. And again, he came to the same kind of conclusion that more often it improved the effectiveness of the chemo and decreased the toxicity. And these are just some other studies you know, suggesting the same thing. This one, they looked at the effect of glutathione on, um, on, on the, the nerve damage that they got from uh, oxplatin. And again, here they found that the neuropathy, which is typical with the platin, uh, platinum drugs, um, w w was reduced from 42% to, to 27% by adding the glutathione. This one, they used vitamin E with cisplatin, and they showed that uh, that uh, you, they reduced the neuropathy from 85% to 31%. And then there was various other ones, again, kind of showing the same things, using different kinds of anti antioxidant just to decrease toxicity, just to decrease neurotoxicity, heart damage, lung damage, mucositis, bone marrow damage. <clears throat> so even just using them, you know, to, to help patients tolerate their chemotherapy can be very useful. Um, 
this is a, a couple of case reports. Um, and in this one, they had two cases of women with advanced ovarian cancer. And they had the standard chemotherapy. But they were also put on high dose oral antioxidants plus intravenous vitamin C. And when they added that, they found that both of the patients showed no evidence of disease three years later, which is very unusual for ovarian cancer. It usually recurs quite quickly. Um, this is another uh, report of three cases. Um, and these were cases where they actually declined the chemotherapy. They were only getting the vitamins and intravenous vitamin C. And in these ones, they were, these were published because they showed unexpectedly long survival times. One of them looked like it was actually cured. Uh, and this one, again, was only using intravenous vitamin C and oral supplements. Uh, another study where they were looking at breast cancer patients. And again, this one, they were looking more just at quality of life. They weren't really looking at the, uh, necessarily the survival, but just at reducing the toxicity. So here they added intravenous vitamin C um, to the women getting the standard treatment. And they found that uh, adding the vitamin C had significant reduction in most of the toxicity symptoms that you see with chemotherapy. Decreased nausea, loss of appetite, fatigue, depression, sleep disorders, dizziness, uh, bleeding tendencies were all reduced when they added the vitamin C. And then of course you get this kind of paper. So this is like your, your anti-vitamin C paper. So this, this was a laboratory study, but again, this, this was very well publicized. Um, so in this one, they said the effect of pretreatment with dehydroascorbic acid on the cytotoxicity of uh, a few different kinds of chemotherapy drugs. So what they did here is they, they were using different, uh, different uh, cancer, you know, different cell types of cancer, testing chemotherapy on it, and then adding what they called vitamin C. And they said when they added the vitamin C, the chemo didn't work as well. Um, so again, the world went out, vitamin C is going to interfere with, the, with your chemotherapy, stay away from vitamin C. Um, there's a few things that were not discussed so much in this. First, one of the, the main ones, though, is that you would think that a, a paper with the title of vitamin C antagonizes, that they would have tested vitamin C. They didn't exactly. What they tested was uh, dehydroascorbic acid, which is an oxidized form of vitamin C. Um, oxidized vitamin C is what we throw away. So when we're doing treatments, if uh, vitamin C sits a little too long, it starts oxidizing. We don't use that. But in this paper, they said, well, what's the difference? You know, red, vitamin C, oxidized, what's, all this, what's the difference? Fortunately, a few years later, um, <coughs> in Europe, they did another, they kind of repeated the study. Um, but this one, they actually did divide it up. And here they used the de dehydroascorbate and they also use real vitamin C. And, then, and they said there is a difference. They're not the same thing. So here they, when they showed that they used the real vitamin C, um, they showed two things. One is that the vitamin C by itself was having an anti-cancer effect on the cell cultures. And when they combined it with the chemotherapy, it did not interfere with the chemo. It either had no effect on the chemo or it improved the effect of the chemo. But there, it shows, there's a big difference though between using proper vitamin C and using oxidized. Now this is just more the conclusion that uh, the ascorbate uh, enhanced the cytotoxicity of certain drugs with, with a, a neutral effect on the others. And again, their comment was that the, 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 just the vitamin C was inducing apoptosis and causing cell cycle arrest in, in the cancer cells. Uh, just, a, just another uh, vitamin C in survival study. Um, this one, they looked at 10 prospective studies using either vitamin C as a supplement 
or increasing vitamin C containing foods, one or the other. Um, and they said, you know, adding uh, the vitamin C, this is an oral supplement, this is not intravenous, it was just, again, modest doses. But just adding that decreased the, uh, the total deaths by 19%. And if they were doing it actually by high vitamin C foods, then they had a 27% decrease. Which would make sense because when you're getting the vitamin C in the food, you're getting it combined with a whole group of other antioxidants. And this one was actually a, a randomized controlled trial using uh, oral supplements and, uh, and intravenous vitamin C. Um, in the report, when they reported it, they were only reporting the, um, the decrease in the toxicity, that they were protecting the healthy uh, tissues. What they didn't report in the paper, though, is that it actually did look like it was decreasing the, the death rates, too. But that was not reported because it was, they were just showing a trend. They weren't showing the statistically significant. This is just kind of an interesting um, situation and it, um, because, again, often what we're dealing with, um, the way a lot of uh, vitamin research is treated is that it gets dismissed. And it gets dismissed very easily by just saying, there's no evidence. So what does evidence mean? Um, and this is just more an example of how it's being misused. Uh, so this, this was just an example that, I don't know if you remember this story, it was uh, back in 2010, there was uh, in New Zealand, this was all over the internet, this was reported. Um, this uh, this uh, farmer uh, got the swine flu, and he, got, he was very sick with it. He was in a coma, and they were expecting him to die very soon. And they had really nothing to do for it, they had no treatment. But the family was not happy with that, and they started reading all over the, the internet what they could do they came across vit intravenous vitamin C as a treatment for viral diseases. So they went to the hospital and said, why don't we give them some intravenous vitamin C? <clears throat> and their answer was, we won't do it. We won't do it, there's no evidence, it's not scientific, maybe it's dangerous, we're not going to do it. So the family didn't stop there, they went to court. And they presented to a judge and the judge said, give them the vitamin C. You know, you're, you're going to hurt him with it. You know, he's going to die in a few days anyways. <clears throat> so they did. And, uh, and then he made a full recovery. So he completely recovered, came out of the coma, went back to full functioning. Um, but again, there the was still the position was, is that we're not going to give this treatment because there is no evidence. The year before this, there's a, uh, a manual called Guidelines for the Provision and Assessment of Nutrition Support Therapy in the Adult Critically Ill Patient. <clears throat> so there's two organizations in the United States, the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the American Society for Parental and Enteral Nutrition, and they put out these manuals um, on evidence-based treatments for critically ill patients. So in two, again, the year before this, um, their 2009 recommendations was high-dose intravenous antioxidant therapy should be used for all critically ill patients based on a review of the scientific studies showing that uh, things like intravenous vitamin C even at only a gram every eight hours and other antioxidants showed improved clinical in outcomes. Um, so their evidence-based manual said you should be giving intravenous vitamin C. The response of the doctors was there is no evidence so therefore we're not going to do it. So it's just, you have to be careful how this is being used. I mean, it's being used not necessarily based on whether there's really evidence, but as a way of dismissing something that you don't want to have to deal with. Actually, just uh, in a similar line, there was, um, there was, there was a study done at a, an American hospital this time, again, using intravenous vitamin C for septic shock. So septic shock is a, an infection that you pick up in the hospital um, that there, is very, there really is no treatment for. Like 80% uh, of the patients die if they get into septic shock, no matter what they do. 
So they, they took a group of these patients in this hospital and they gave them intravenous vitamin C, plus a couple of other nutrients. Um, and they, I think they reduced the death rate from something like 80% to, I don't know, 20% or 15%, just with a very simple intervention. And this is very dramatic. And this, again, this is something that there is no treatment for and is a major cause of, de cause of death in hospitals. So very simple. And still, the response from a lot of the medical world was, well, it's still not proven enough. We're not going to use it. You know, maybe it's dangerous. I mean, it, was, it doesn't matter <laughs> how good the evidence is that uh, if, it's, if it's something that's outside of their standard treatments, it tends to usually get dismissed. Um, this is another uh, clinical trial uh, that was done with advanced cancer patients. These were people that had received you know, their standard treatments. They were considered now resistant to chemotherapy and likely nothing's going to help them. Um, and what they did is they, they actually gave them intravenous vitamin C, usually together with a chemotherapy drug that may be helpful, um, but they assumed was not going to be. Um, and in this one, and again, these were this was very end stage patients. These were you know pretty tough cases, uh, but they still showed that when they gave them the the intravenous vitamin C with a with a, another chemotherapy drug, they said half the patients didn't show any benefit. It didn't really make much difference, but half of them did show some. It wasn't necessarily miracles, but they were still showing a period of stable disease. Um, they're, you know, they're still showing that they improve the quality and the length of their life, at least in half the patients. Um, and again, with no evidence of any toxicity. And the frustrated uh, researchers here, um, there were conclusions that despite its biological and clinical plausibility, it is ignored by conventional cancer investigations and funding agencies. Um, and this is just kind of another interesting one, just looking at vitamin C deficiency. Because they looked at uh, patients coming into a hospital saying when they, when they checked them, 60% of them were already deficient in vitamin C coming into the hospital. So they, they already were like at subclinical scurvy levels. Aside from the therapeutic effects of vitamin C, you know, vitamin C is also even just treating a deficiency. And they found that after they're in the hospital for 17 days, they were no better off. So the hospital food didn't improve their vitamin C. Okay, now just getting into some uh, theories of cancer. Um, th this was a theory that was proposed years ago, which was interesting. They were calling uh, tumors are wounds that do not heal. And what they saw with cancer, that cancer behaves very much like a wound. <coughs> Um, it releases a lot of the same factors. It creates inflammation, angiogenic things to grow blood vessels, all growth factors. It's, it's using all very similar methods that cancer uses. The only difference is that in wounds, once the wound is healed, all that gets shut off. Whereas in cancer cells, it doesn't. These processes just keep continuing. But again, a lot of the process of cancer are actually normal mechanisms that are built into our cells that are being used in an inappropriate way. And now I'm going to go through um, a series of cancer. Um, if we're looking at uh, what cancer is and how it operates, and then what does that lead to and how we can then deal with it better. Uh, so these are, are, are just kind of accepted things about cancer. There are, there are certain things in the body's environment that will help promote cancer. Um, so these are things like increased oxidation, increased free radicals, inflammation, the immune system failure, if the immune system fails to respond to the cancer cells, um, glycemia. So uh, high amounts of blood sugar and high insulin levels will also promote cancer growth. Uh, and also stress hormones. If you want stress, it's pu putting out a lot of uh, cortisol and stress hormones. It's more indirectly that will affect both the immune suppression and inflammation and also, you know, promote cancer growth. Um, this is a nice slide. Um, this is just summarizing a lot of information that we have. Um, looking at, you know, that we do have a fair bit of understanding 
of cancer mechanisms and the way natural substances can influence it. So this is looking at various kinds of natural substances, um, things like uh, green tea extracts and curcumin and resveratrol, uh, various uh, known substances, and, and showing how these either affect expressions of, uh, of, of genes or even the genes themselves. Um, what's maybe more important with this slide is that there's a couple of things. One is that you'll see a lot of these substances showing up in many different places. You know, so you, you know, again, if you have something like curcumin, you're going to see it showing up in many different mechanisms in the cancer cell. Um, not only that, then you'll see overlaps that you have multiple things affecting the same mechanism. And usually that'll help with the synergism. You can get a much stronger effect if you can have more than one thing going after a particular target. Um, so here we're seeing that we have, like I said, uh, individual things that affect many targets and many different things affecting the same targets. Um, this is just another way of looking at things that are the way cancer cells are operating. Um, so we see that the, the behavior of cancer cells is that they show genetic instability, allowing mutations to occur easily. They show the abnormal expression of normal genes. We were showing with the, uh, the, the cancer as a, as a wound that you're turning on these genes to, you know, that maybe are intended to repair damage, but end up promoting the growth of the cancer cells abnormal signal transduction, so they're, they're, they're changing the way the cells are responding to signals. Um, included in cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication, um, induction of angiogenesis, these cells need to grow blood vessels to provide nutrients, um, they invade and metastasize, and again, they, they are able to evade the immune system detection. And that when we're looking at treating it, we want to try to address all of those factors as much as we can. We're going to go through them individually in a little bit. Um, when you look at what has been the accepted theory of cancer up until now, um, is that if you ask almost any oncologist, you say, well, what is cancer? Um, the answer pretty much everywhere in the world is, Cancer is a series of, of genetic damage, a series of mutations. You say you get one mutation, another one, another one. After enough mutations, the, can, the cells convert into a cancer cell. And this has been the, the accepted uh, theory, if you want, of how cancer works. In fact, it's been so accepted that it was almost not even called a theory anymore. They're saying this is what cancer is. Now, in 2006, um, based on this theory, they started a project um, that, that they called the End of Cancer Genome Project. So they had the technology now where you can take a cell and map out all of the genes in it fairly quickly. So they started a project where they were intending to look at 10,000 different kinds of tumors and map out all of the genes and then correlate which mutations are connected to which kind of cancer and then we're going to design our drugs to go after these mutations and there was a lot of excitement in 2006 saying, you know, this is going to be the end of cancer. You know, now we're going to solve it. So in 2015, um, they published this uh, report. What were the results? So they discovered, you know, 10 million cancer-related mutations. But the result was is that they could find almost no correlation to anything. They couldn't find any consistent mutations that were connected to a certain kind of cancer. Um, maybe even worse for the theory is they found cancer cells that were cancer cells, aggressive cancer cells, containing none of the mutations that they thought were essential. So all of a sudden, this, this whole mutation theory was, was coming into question. And, and on top of that, they're also showing that even when they did find certain mutations and certain targets, and they were able to go after that target, it didn't work for very long. It may have slowed the growth of the cancer temporarily, and then very quickly it just starts to switch to different mechanisms and it starts back up again. So the whole you know, targeted uh, cancer treatments and uh, biological treatments that have had, again, so much excitement in practice 
they're not working out so well. So then we're going back to an old theory. Uh, th this is from Otto Wardberg. Um, this paper was from 1956, but he was actually started his work in the 1930s. And, uh, and back then, even with more limited technology, um, he found that there was something that seemed to be the same about every cancer cell. Didn't matter where it came from. There was one thing that was the same, which he called the cancer metabolism, or the cellular respiration. Um, and what he was finding that, as opposed to normal cells, that will normally take oxygen with glucose and produce lots of uh, ATP, lots of energy, he said the cancer cells weren't operating that way. He said the cancer cells, they were using fermentation, which meant that it was just anaerobic. And even if there was lots of oxygen available, the cancer cells weren't utilizing it very much. They were using a very inefficient mechanism, which is glycolysis, um, or they call fermentation. And he said this was a characteristic that he found of, uh, of, of pretty much every cancer cell. <coughs> Um, enough that he, he, he was actually concluding that this is cancer. That when the cancer cell makes this shift in metabolism, then it becomes cancerous. And at the time, he even got the Nobel Prize for this work. And still, you, you know, the, the Warburg effect is, you know, is, is recognized widely. In the cancer world, they say, well, you know, cancer cells show the Warburg effect. They show this change in metabolism. What it was usually assumed, though, is, was, well, that's just what cancer cells do. His position is that that's what they are. And there's been a lot more work that's gone on in more recent years around this theory that's now becoming the metabolic theory of cancer. Um, this, uh, this one researcher, Siegfried, has been doing a lot of work with this. Um, this was a paper that he did in 2010. He's since put out a whole textbook you know, summarizing all the research in the area. And what he's saying is that, uh, that the impaired energy metabolism is the defining character characteristic of nearly all cancers, regardless of the cell origin, what Warburg was saying. And the general hypothesis that even ge the genetic instability that, that you'll see in cancer cells, you see these mutations going on, but it's looking more like that's the result of the of this uh, change in metabolism rather than the cause of the cancer. And that would explain why you can have cancer cells without the mutations. And then there was uh, some other work, you know, kind of going on very quietly. Uh, this was done at two other universities in the States. And again, because of the better technology, you can actually take cells and rearrange them. You can take a piece out of a cell and rearrange it. So this is what they did. They took the nucleus from a cancer cell. So supposedly with all the mutations, all the genetic damage, but they put it into the cytoplasm of a normal cell. And most often what happened was it behaved like a normal cell, not like a cancer cell. Supposedly with all of these oncogenes and cancer mutations, you stuck it into a normal cytoplasm and it behaved normally. Um, a different university basically repeated the same thing with uh, a little more rigid, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, control, but came to the same conclusion. And then they did the reverse. So here they took a normal nucleus, so it's a healthy cell, no mutations, no genetic damage, but they put it into the cytoplasm of a cancer cell. And more, most often it converted into a cancer cell, it behaved as a cancer cell. So it doesn't look like what was going on in the DNA had much effect on whether it was going to behave like cancer or not. There was something else going on. And again, what it's looking like is that the, the, the thing that's initiating all of this is damage to the normal respiration, which is the mitochondria. So when the mitochondria are damaged, um, they find that it actually sends off signals you know, to the DNA, to the nucleus, to activate these genes in an attempt to repair the damage, but again, this is the wounds that do not heal. It's activating these repair mechanisms that are basically what are the cancer genes. So they're activating these, these genes uh, for proliferation, 
that 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 add to uh, to turning off the, the normal apoptosis, the death signals, which is also largely controlled by the mitochondria. So when the mitochondria are damaged, it also interferes with the normal death signals of the cell. So they just keep going. This was kind of an interesting paper too, because I said there's there's kind of two new theories. There's this metabolic theory of the cancer, and also what they call the cancer stem cell theory. That you know, sort of in the in every cancer, there's a group of stem cells that are responsible for the growth of the cancer and the spreading of the cancer. What this was looking at is that you're probably just describing the same thing from two different directions. That in fact, when you have these metabolic changes when the, the, when the mitochondria are damaged, the kind of changes that take place in the cell is, a, is kind of a de-differentiation. They become more primitive, and then they become more like a stem cell. So this whole stem cell theory of cancer and the metabolic theory is probably describing the same process. Okay, and, and this is looking at, uh, you know, if, we're, if we're looking at the, this metabolic theory, um, we're also seeing that, that cancer cells are very dependent on glucose in high amounts. Glycolysis is, a, is actually a very inefficient process. You don't get much ATP out of it. Most of the energy is coming from the mitochondrial respiration. Uh, and that's damaged in the cancer cells, so they're relying mostly on glycolysis. So they need a lot of glucose in order to get their energy needs. Um, and, and that's actually the basis of what the PET CT is. You know, when you're giving, doing a PET CT, you're injecting radioactive glucose in order to identify where the cancer is. The reason it works is because cancer cells are taking up about 20 times more glucose than normal cells because of this increased need for it. Um, so what this means is that, well, maybe there's some benefit to reducing the food supply to the cancer cells, which is reducing the carbohydrates. Um, and what's been developed now is uh, what's become known as the ketogenic diet for cancer. So now they're, they're testing diets very low in carbohydrate, so you're decreasing the direct source of uh, glucose to the cancer. But what happens in the body when you reduce carbohydrates your body starts converting fats into ketones. And ketones are fine for our normal cells. It's a fine energy source in place of glucose, except ketones are used in the mitochondria, which means they're not very available to the cancer cells. Not only that, but they found that high ketones in themselves seem to be suppressive of cancer cell growth, even if there is carbohydrate around. So the combination of lower carbohydrate plus increased ketones, they're finding is able to inhibit uh, the cancer cell growth. And it's looking good enough that they've started now several clinical trials using the ketogenic diet as a treatment by itself in combination with other oxygen type therapies in combination with chemotherapies. And then they're, they're, they've been looking at a number of other things that are targeting glycolysis in, in cancer cells. So if you can inhibit glycolysis, you can selectively go after the cancer cells because our normal cells are not using much of it. Um, so one of the substances that they started looking at was uh, dichloroacetate, or DCA. Um, and this, there was a university in Canada that started looking at this a lot. DCA was a drug that was already on the market for treating some genetic uh, m metabolic disorders in children. So it's something that was already on the market that they could start testing for cancer. They tested it in cultures, in animals, and they even got to some small clinical trials. Um, <clears throat> and showing that, uh, that not only was the, the DCA inhibiting glycolysis, it was pushing metabolism towards the mitochondria. And they thought it was working in two ways. One is that it was, again, decreasing the energy supply for the cancer, but if it was able to reactivate the mitochondria, it was also able to reactivate the apoptosis signals and maybe actually signal the cancer cells to die now. And they said they even went as far as small clinical trials and then 
there was no more funding. Another one that was getting researched a lot at Johns Hopkins with this other molecule called 3-bromopyruvate. Uh, same idea, they found that uh, 3-bromopyruvate was a very fat, powerful blocker of one of the main uh, enzymes in glycolysis that they call hexokinase 2. They found that it's blocking even other enzymes in glycolysis, not just that one. But when this one, they tested it on uh, 19 uh, rats, <coughs> They, with different kinds of cancers, they found that they cured all of them in, in, the, in, the, in the mouse models. They had one case study that they reported, um, which was actually a, a young, uh, young teenager with uh, liver cancer, who at this point already had 95% of his liver replaced by cancer. And they actually got permission to give him the bromopyruvate directly into the hepatic artery, right into the tumor, basically. And they did this, you know, repeated times, and they found that they, it dis disappeared, that the cancer actually disappeared. I mean, there's, 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 you know, work in the states trying to get funding to do more work with this particular molecule, but again, it's, it's, it's working on that same principle that if you can shut down the metabolism of the cancer cell, you can turn it off. Another one that's working actually very similar to bromopyruvate. Um, there's another molecule called methylglyoxal. And methylglyoxal, they've actually been looking at it for almost 100 years. Um, it's a natural substance that's produced uh, in all of our cells. But they also found it's a very powerful blocker of, of one enzyme called glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, dehydrogenase. Um, and plus, it was interfering with what they call mitochondrial complex 1. So in the mitochondria, you have these four complexes that are involved in the, the energy production. Um, but which is really interesting, though, that they found that this, uh, this complex one in the mitochondria of cancer cells, these are damaged mitochondria, they found that this substance was blocking the, the complex one in the cancer cells, but not in healthy cells. So it was interfering both with the abnormal metabolism in the mitochondria plus the glycolysis. Uh, interesting too, they also, um, uh, they, they, this is found naturally in one food, um, which uh, you may have heard about called uh, manuka, that's spelled wrong, manuka honey. So manuka honey is this honey from New Zealand that was getting a lot of interest in the medical world because they found that it was doing a really good job of treating wound infections. And when they looked at the, the honey, they said, well, why is it working so well? They found high amounts of, of this same substance, the methylglyoxal, naturally in the honey, that seemed to be working as a very good antibiotic, too. <clears throat> and there, there's a, gr a group in, uh, actually, India that's, that's been pr going into this in a lot more detail. And they actually got to the point of even a three-phase uh, human study of cancer patients. Um, and they showed when they added the methylglyoxal in certain protocols, they benefited almost all the patients. Um, there was a group of them that seemed to go into complete remission, another that group that went into partial remission, and a group that didn't seem to change the progress of the cancer, but it improved their symptoms. So even as a palliative substance, it seemed to be helpful. And they found no toxicity you know, to normal cells. So it's, again, another substance that's looking very promising and going after this particular mechanism in the cancer. Um, interesting, melatonin um, is another substance that's been showing some interesting anti-cancer effects. Um, in Italy, there's a group of oncologists who ran multiple uh, clinical trials with melatonin in all kinds of combinations with chemotherapy, with radiation, uh, showing that it was improving the results of the treatment when they added it. And it wasn't clear. They've been finding a lot of different mechanisms of how melatonin is working, but more recently, they also found that it's inhibiting the metabolism of the cancer cells as another mechanism. Um, this was just a review paper with melatonin where they looked at a uh, meta-analysis of eight uh, clinical trials. Um, and the melatonin as being an add-on to chemotherapy and radiation. 
And they found that you know, th there was uh, approximately it, uh, doubled the amount of complete and partial remission rates in one year survival just by adding this one substance. And, it's, uh, and, and also, the, uh, it's cut off in the bottom there, but it was saying it also had a dramatic decrease in the amount of toxicity on the normal cells of the radiation and chemo. This was another, this was an actually a clinical trial done in France. <clears throat> there was a group there that had actually been working on this same metabolic theory for many years. Um, and they were looking for substances to, again, block the metabolism in the cancer cells. Initially, they found 27 different things that had effects on inhibiting glycolysis. Then they narrowed it down to seven that they thought were working better. Then they started using them two at a time. And they finally came up with a pair that seemed to be working pretty well. And they took that pair and they ran a clinical trial. And like most of these clinical trials, um, they do them on people after nothing else is working. So these are patients that were considered terminal. They, you know, they'd gone through chemo, radiation, whatever the standard treatments were, and nothing was working, and said they were, most of them were given a few months to live. So these are like the worst possible cases they took into a clinical trial. And what they, the two substances that they found that were working well was alpha-lipoic acid and hydroxycitrate. And these are two substances that have been on the market already for years for other things. So there are two commonly available supplements, and this is what they did a clinical trial for these very serious cancer patients. Uh, they published uh, their results after a year when it was expected that none of them would be alive. And they found that about 70% of them were still alive. And that was either using these supplements by themselves or using them combined with some other standard treatment. And again, was showing really essentially no side effects of using these substances. So this was like a, a little more formal yeah, you know, testing of can we affect this met metabolism of cancer and show some real clinical results. Okay, so let's just go back to um, what are called the hallmarks of cancer. So these are kind of the generally accepted qualities or characteristics of cancer. They call cell sufficiency and growth signals, insensitivity to growth inhibiting signals, evasion of apoptosis, limited uh, re uh, reproduction, uh, stimulating angiogenesis, and invading and metastasizing tissues. And again, when they look at all of these things that characterize cancer, almost all of them can be produced by damage to mitochondria. Okay, so now if we start looking at uh, going through these different things and how do we address them. Um, so, we, there's, so we're looking at the genetic damage, genetic instability. Um, again, there are multiple compounds that can help protect the DNA from, from further damage and mutations. Um, possibly hundreds or thousands of compounds that occur naturally. Uh, some of the ones that have investigated more are the antioxidant vitamins like vitamin E and C, minerals like selenium and zinc, other bioflavonoids, uh, things like curcumin, EGCG, which is the green tea extract, resveratrol, and other things like alpha-lipoic acid. Aside from their metabolic effects, can also have some, uh, some uh, protective effects. <clears throat> this abnormal expression of genes, turning on these oncogenes, you can have effects on those with a lot of natural substances. Um, so we, again, we have things like vitamin C and E, melatonin, vitamin D is very important for that. Uh, curcumin, again, the green tea. Genistein is a, is a substance that you'll find in soy or certain kinds of soy. Uh, resveratrol, selenium, quercetin, all of these things can affect these, these oncogene expressions. Okay, signal transduction. So you have chemicals that are signaling cells to regulate their growth. And again, we have used natural compounds to affect that signaling. So here we have things like Boswellia. Uh, Boswellia is one is a substance that often is used for treating inflammation. 
arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, but it's again, it's affecting uh, the, this, the, these growth signals. Uh, again, curcumin, EPA, and DHA, which is the omega-3 fish oils. Um, other inflammatory, garlic, again, melatonin, um, a couple of other um, you know, extracts from foods, uh, vitamin E. So all of these things can affect the signaling. <coughs> cell to cell communication. There's another interesting quality of cancer cells is that normally cells talk to each other and, they, and populations of cells, they control each other's growth. You know, they give signals, say, okay, enough, you stop now. And cancer cells turn off a lot of that. So they don't listen to you know, the other cells around them. They do their own thing. Um, but there, in, there are compounds that can kind of uh, maybe scream at the cancer cells a little more. And these are things like vitamin A, again, genistein, the green tea extract, melatonin, resveratrol, selenium, vitamin D. If you notice, we're seeing a lot of the same things appearing in many different mechanisms. Um, invasion and metastasis. Again, this is one of the main defining things of uh, cancer is that it, it spreads. But it doesn't just spread, it has, to, it has mechanisms that it uses, including enzymes to dissolve tissue and to, you know, to spread through tissues. <clears throat> and here again, there's, a, there's natural compounds that can interfere with these enzymes that the cancers are using to help them spread. Again, things like Boswellia, uh, Gotukola is another uh, good natural herbal treatment. Other antioxidant, proanthocyanidines, resveratrol, vitamin C, vitamin A, curcumin, green tea, again, the omega-3s. And other things that, that reduce the, the ability of the cancer cells to move. Here we go with vitamin D, omega-3s, genistein, melatonin. And then we deal with the immune surveillance. So again, the, you know, our immune system normally would not allow these cancer cells to continue. But cancer cells can hide from the immune system. So there are things that can try to improve the ability of the, of the immune system to find the cancer and go after it. Um, some of the mushrooms are best known for this. Things like shiitake, maitake, other mushrooms have compounds that can help the immune system function. Zinc is important for that, selenium, glutathione, um, which is again something we produce naturally in our <laughs> tissues. Um, vitamin C, melatonin, other enzymes um, like, uh, like bromelain, pancreatic enzymes, can also help with, this, uh, with the immune system function. One of the ways they think some of these enzymes work is, um, is by destroying some of the um, maybe protein sort of protections that the cancer cells use. And then, then there's, the, again, the whole metabolism, the blood sugar and insulin regulation. So again, you know, tumors you know, are using you know, can, you know, glucose here, they find you know, somewhere between 10 and 50 times more. And we know even just statistically, diabetics are more prone to cancer of breast, prostate, colon, liver, pancreas, um, for two reasons. One is because of the glucose itself. Again, it's, it is the, the food supply, it's the energy source for the cancer. But also, if you have high blood sugar levels, you're gonna start producing more insulin, and another one, which is IGF-1, to deal with the sugar. But these hormones are also growth factors, and cancer cells tend to have a lot of receptors for them. So not only is the sugar promoting the growth, but the stimulation of these hormones is further stimulating the growth of the cancer cell. So here you want to have things that are going to both reduce the blood sugar and the secondary insulin levels. So again, the, the, the core of it is to, is to be on the low carbohydrate diet. Um, other things though, like vitamin D, berberine, which is another very nice substance that not only lowers blood sugar, it seems to have some other direct anti-cancer effects. Cinnamon, chromium, another particular one called coffee berry, uh, holy basil is another herb that does it. There's others. Um, but these are some things that will work more directly on reducing blood sugar and insulin levels, which is also a good treatment for diabetes. So if we're looking at how do we now, how, how do we plan for a patient? You know, what, what kind of things are we going to give them? 
So if we're looking at a, at a supplement program, um, we would want to include elements from all of these different categories. So you want to give good levels of vitamin D, vitamin A, uh, vitamin K2, which is another fat-soluble vitamin that looks like it's a partner with vitamin A and D, so it should be part of that, that whole complex. Uh, vitamin E, uh, again, and certain forms of vitamin E. Um, interestingly, when they did those, um, those uh, studies, when they were giving vitamin E you know, to the, the head and neck cancer and those lung cancer, the smoking prevention ones, um, what they gave was vitamin E acetate, which is a synthetic vitamin E. And that form of vitamin E actually doesn't have much anti-cancer effect itself. The, the natural forms, either tocotrienols or vitamin E succinate, although it's there, you know, they're all called vitamin E, but they have very different effects on the cancer cells. So, if we want to, so we want to add vitamin E in this mixture, but we want the right forms of it too. Um, the omega-3s are good to top up, both because of their anti-cancer effect, also because we're all deficient in it. Um, curcumin, again, is a very good one. That one's been looked at a lot, and they've been finding, I think they're up to something like 90 different ways it's working against cancer. Uh, the green tea extracts, uh, resveratrol that you get from uh, you know, grape skins. Although they, they found if you want to get your resveratrol from, from wine, from like dark red wine, you probably need a daily dose. Of, I think it's somewhere around 100 bottles a day. So you can get it that way or you can get supplements. Um, and then there's certain foods that are very high in certain things. You know, Brazil nuts are a very high source of selenium. Broccoli sprouts are very good for two really good anti-cancers. Uh, Compounds. One is sulforaphane and the other one is uh, I3C. And these are especially good for the hormone related cancers. Um, and underneath that, it just, uh, it's, I just have in brackets about the sulforaphane. Um, and even seaweed, you know, the atsotiam is actually, um, there's a lot of good antioxidants, but also the iodine content. And iodine can be also important for things like breast cancer and prostate cancer. And then, again, now we want to really go after this metabolic aspect of cancer. And th this is, I think, a direction to, be, to try to go after much more aggressively. <clears throat> so here we can use the ketogenic diet. Um, nowadays, I'm, I'm, I'm actually putting most of my cancer patients on a ketogenic diet. Not just any ketogenic diet. There actually are many. But we want the ketogenic diet for cancer. Um, Actually, the difference with it is that um, ketogenic diets like the Atkins diet, which is also a very low carbohydrate, but it's very high in protein. And protein is not necessarily that we want really high amounts of. Because uh, one other thing a cancer cell can use, aside from glucose, is glutamine. It's an amino acid that actually can be used by the cancer cells. So we don't necessarily want to give large amounts of that either. So in the ketogenic diet for cancer is actually much higher in fat. It doesn't really increase the protein, but it increases the fats a lot. Um, so we're using that. Again, a lot of people won't do it just because it's not a lot of fun. So a lot of people won't do it, but as much as we can, we try to use it. Um, they found if you add an oxygen type therapy to it, like hyperbaric oxygen, it'll magnify the benefits. Um, and then, of course, like in this clinical trial that they showed the alpha-lipoic acid, which we can do either orally or intravenously, hydroxycitrate, um, again, that they used in the clinical trial. Some of these other substances are not so available, but they're things that we may be able to start using soon. Things like DCA, bromopyruvate, uh, phenylbutyrate is another one. It's another th substance that we produce in our bodies, but it's available as a supplement. Um, and again, the methylglyoxal and melatonin, which are all you know, fairly powerful you know, blockers of this whole metabolic process. So again, I mean, just as a summary, <clears throat> you were looking at trying to correct as many as the cancer promoting things as possible, it means reducing toxins, free radicals, all this kind of stuff that's gonna promote it. Uh, try to go after this underlying cancer metabolism um, the more 
And, and get, generally, again, because cancers have so many ways of operating, the more ways you can go after it, usually the better the result's going to be. And this is one of the big problems with all the new targeted therapies. They're going after one function. And again, when they find what you go after the one function, at best you get a temporary effect. But very soon the cancer just shifts over to another method. So we want to try to block multiple directions at the same time, not to give it too many ways out. And then using them in combination. Again, when you're using them in combination, then you're getting not just added effects, you're getting synergy. You're getting multiplied effects. And of course, when we're doing it, we want to also, most of these patients are going to be getting conventional treatments too, and we want to try to minimize the amount of damage that they may be getting from those. So now you know everything. <laughs>